Welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega. And this week, I'm joined by a very special guest, somebody I've known for actually quite a while, Sandy Holman, who is an original Apollo crew member. And Sandy, we've been talking for a long time, but I've just never had a chance to write something about you. And I apologize for that because you were there for some really interesting moments in Scientology history. And I don't I don't know that people are as familiar with you as they should be. Uh, could you first give us a thumbnail, kind of an overall view of your involvement in Scientology? Sure. Um, I uh, joined this. Well, I got into Scientology in August of 1971, and I um, went almost immediately to the Apollo, having had very little Scientology experience. I had uh, done the COM course, and um, I had one failed Dianetic session. Where And what part of the country were you in when you got into it? Uh, I would got in at the Santa Clara franchise uh, in California, where a lot of people got in. Yeah, uh, um, it was a very successful franchise. The recruitment mission that um, got me into the Sea Org was also quite famous. Um, probably the most successful recruitment mission uh, in the history of the Sea Org. And how um, did they? How did they do it? How did they convince you? Yeah. Just brand new in Scientology to yeah. just drop everything and go out to a ship in the ocean. Well, so um, <clears throat> Bob Young was uh, the captain of the boulevard, and he did this tour, I think, from Seattle to San Diego, where he stopped at every port along the way. We had news that he was coming from our local franchise, and my brother, who was responsible for getting me into Scientology, said, let's go visit the boulevard when it comes into port in San Francisco. So we went uh, and um, uh, Bob Young talked to us and he was very low key, you know, kind of like, well, you know, you want to try it out. Why don't you just uh, come on board and we'll sail down to LA and you can see how you like the experience. You know, I think it was at the most a week of sailing. Well, and what kind of a ship was the boulevard? It was small. Uh, don't ask me what kind it was. I <laughs> it was it was a you know a quarter the size of the Apollo or less. Okay. It, it okay. was a little a little ship. Okay. Um. So uh, you know, I was put in the galley, um, clean doing cleanup and stuff, and I I slept in a hammock. Uh, and and you know when we left San Francisco, we sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was a sunny, clear day, and it was all gorgeous and. Uh, very romantic, and um, a wedding was performed on board the ship. I think it was Neil Sarfati, who who was the port captain on the ship, who performed the wedding. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it was cool, you know. And I, no one had asked me to sign a Sea Org contract at this point. Um, so we sailed down to L.A. and uh, I think I went in and I talked to a recruiter in the Celebrity Center. And she told me that, um, oh, I was 19, by the way. I was about a month away from my 20th birthday. And she told me that if I wanted to um, join the Sea Org, I could get all my services for free. And then after I had reached clear or whatever state I wanted to reach, I could take a lifetime leave of absence. Well, that sounded a lot better than paying for all my services because um, I had only done one year of college and didn't have any money at all. And uh, so I thought, well, that sounds kind of cool. And then uh, Annie Tasket came on on the on board the Boulevard from Flag. She um, gave us all aptitude tests and IQ tests and all that stuff. And she wanted me right away and said, you your test scores are really good and we want you to sign the CR contract and we're going to send you to flag. Well, that had not been my plan. So I really molded over for a couple of days. I was nervous about it. I'd never been out of the state of California at that point. Wow. And of course they wouldn't tell me where the flagship was only that L Ron Hubbard was on it and it was the Mecca and you know, all things good. So, um, I said, well, sure. Okay. Let's, I mean, 
I had nothing to lose. Yeah, you were young. It was an adventure, right? It was an adventure. So uh, I signed my Sierra contract. They put me on a plane. Um, I went along with nine other recruits, all men. I was the only woman. And um, we they flew us from uh, L.A. to New York and then from New York to Madrid, where we met up with, um, and there was a team there, two guys who, you know, said that they were Scientologists. And we said, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to Operation Transport Corporation. We don't know anything about what you're talking about with Scientology. And they kind of laughed and said, yeah, yeah, we know. But, you know, really we're Sea Org members. And really, you know, no matter what you heard before you left the States, you know, we're, we're legit and we're going to send you on your way to the flagship. So, um, yeah, so I, we finally believed them. They put us on a train to Gibraltar. And then from Gibraltar, we took uh, a ferry over to Tangiers, which is where the ship was. Okay. Interestingly, along on that ferry ride, some young ish man came up to me and said oh so where are you headed you know and i said oh i i'm going to um this this ship over here the apollo and and i'm with operation transport corporation he goes oh the scientology ship <laughs> yeah and i was like no no i don't know what you're talking about it's operation transport corporation we'd been drilled on this so um yeah so i got to the ship and um was immediately put on, in the galley, uh, serving the officers in the officers' dining room. And in between meals, I was washing all the dishes. Uh, yeah, so that's that's how I got there. Do you remember your first glimpse of the great Thetan himself? Oh, yes, I do. Um, uh, <laughs> he was walking along the prom deck with a couple of the messengers. And... Um, I was uh, stunned, it, you know, I, I was breathless. I was speechless. I didn't know what to say. Um, as I later described it, I always thought he looked like this. <laughs> and there he was in, in full uniform and walking along. And um, I, I, I stumbled out, um, hello, sir, because I, you know, you're supposed to say good morning, sir, good afternoon, but I didn't know what time of day it was. It was so shocking to see him. And the messengers whispered in in his ear and said, that's new recruit Sandy Holman, you know, and um, he smiled and said hello to me, you know, very nice. So that, yeah, that was the first time I saw him. And Mary Sue was on the ship as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I later worked uh, kind of directly under Mary Sue. So uh, again, what 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 approximate date when you first got there? It was February of nineteen seventy one. Seventy one, and uh, so but you went from the galley to one of the higher level positions on the ship, didn't you? Well, they you know you you've lived many lifetimes, you've done every job, and um, you know how to do it. So just do it, make it go right, and if you don't do a good job, then, you know, you'll be washing toilets was the, you know, so I went, you know, I, I, I went from the galley to, uh, HCO Hubbard communications office. And I became that hat hat maker. I was, I made hat packs for all the crew and distributed them. And I did that for a couple of months. And then, um, some, buddy with a bright idea needed to post a, a, a job called Sea Org Personnel Control Officer, meaning I was in charge of all the people in the Sea Org all over the world. At this point, I was 20, and I didn't know sh sh from Shinola. And um, yeah, I didn't do a good job. Uh, I do remember, so while I was on that post, I got my first messenger run. Um, messenger came down. Uh, to try and find out what was going on with me. And uh, by this point, I had made friends with the messengers because I was not that much older than them. And the first messenger run was from Terry Gillum. And she came down and I said, hi, Terry. And she says, the Commodore wants to know. And I said, 
hi, Terry. She says, no, no, here's how it goes. I talk to him and I exactly duplicate what he is saying in his same tone and his same ver uh, verbiage. And uh, then you answer me as if you're answering the Commodore. And then I go back up to him and I give him your response and I exactly duplicate the way you said it. And I, so she, she was really sweet, actually, you know, she could have yelled at me or whatever, but you know, she, she let me know how it was supposed to go. And so that was my first messenger run. And what was, uh, do you remember what she asked, what the Commodore wanted to know? No, no, it was something about, um, I think, see, we, at that point we had um, FEBCs on board the ship. They were all training to go back to their orgs and be executives. And it was my job to post them in their new orgs um, in whatever position they were supposed to go back to. And there was a protocol, you know, you would post, post an executive director and then an org officer and a product officer, depending on how many students from that org were um, studying on the ship. So it was probably something about, you know, do you, do you, you know, how, how are you going to post these people? Because I hadn't been informed yet how it was supposed to go. Where did you go from that position? Uh, I went back to the galley. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had a committee of evidence. I almost got uh, offloaded. Wow. Um, because I had failed so poorly on the job. Um, and uh, they, they assigned me a condition of probably treason and um, said that I had to do certain things in order to be able to stay on the ship. Uh, so I did. So I went back to the galley for a while. Uh, and then um, I went, I think, to Mimeo. I was a Mimeo reprint operator. Um, and uh, I did that for about a year. Then I met my future husband Roger Barnes he came from ASHO American St. Hill organization in Los Angeles and he had been brought to the ship because he had blown and um, he was a very valuable registrar at that point and for many years he was the highest income earner in, in the Sea Org and also uh, a very um, popular public speaker all around the world. So um, he uh, he kn had known me four weeks when he asked me to marry him. We hadn't even kissed yet. Wow. <laughs> but I think he wanted to stay on the ship. <laughs> and that was one way he could do it, marrying a flagship staff member. Did Hubbard marry you too? No. No, I wasn't that important. And actually, we went um, on an annual leave. Um, back in those days, you could actually get your annual leave. Uh, and we flew to California. We got married at my family cabin in, oh, okay. Gold, in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. But by a Scientology minister from the franchise in Santa Clara. And it was a Scientology service, uh, the, the traditional Scientology wedding ceremony. And then back to the ship? And then back to the ship. Um, Hubbard was away from the ship from September 72. No, wait, December 72 to September 73. That sounds about right. Were you still on the ship at that time? Did you notice that he was gone? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he went with... Um, Paul Preston and Jim Dinkelsey. Right. Um, I remember when he came back, he um, he did a talk for the whole crew down in the lower hold where we had steady, and um, and J and Paul Preston didn't come back with him. And I remember saying to Jim Dinkelsey, who was the medical officer on the ship, I said, "I can't imagine." how could you not, how could you blow from being so close to Hubbard? You know, how, how, how come he didn't return with you guys? And uh, he said, I don't know. I don't know. He just didn't want to come back. 
Interesting, because Jim was his medical officer, and I talked. I talked to Jim before he passed away. I talked to him about that trip, and my understanding about Paul was he was basically a bodyguard. I don't know that. Oh. I don't know what that he did much more than that. But oh, that uh, that sounds that sounds like it could be he was kind of buff. But such a strange episode that Hubbard came to, to kind of hit out in Queens, New York, for seven months, and then went back. Yeah, we didn't know what he was doing, of course, on the ship. And we also, um, when he came back, he brought back a whole bunch of music. Oh, yeah? He'd, yeah. He'd been, um, you know, listening to music in the United States. And uh, he brought back a whole bunch of records. And he played some for us. Um, and, and he was like, uh, you know, he's played one um, that, that was full of doom and gloom. Um, you know, given enough time, I could probably come up with it for you. But. Uh, and he would la laughed and said, this is the number one song in the United States right now. And we were all laughing, you know, and uh, and I think it was after that that he got interested in forming the Apollo stars and doing, um, you know, music performances in the ports that we would get into to for PR reasons. And then uh, you were telling me before that uh, you got into the finances of the uh, ship right. at some point. Right. Um, yeah, I was back in the galley again. Um, and I was uh, in the officer's dining room and Mary Sue had been acting as the ship's assistant guardian, but she was too busy as the controller to continue. So she brought three people from the U.S. to run the, the ship's uh, guardian office and it was ann burgess was the assistant guardian bill fosdick and brian rubinick were the other two um i don't know what their positions were but ann burgess uh took pity on me um she caught me in the dining room one day after a meal and i was crying while i was cleaning up and um I just said, you know, this is just physically exhausting and really, really hard. So she um, ripped me out of the galley and put me on the original uh, IRS audit project. Mm. Mary Sue brought Marty Greenberg to the ship along with his partner, Jim Jackson. Um, she brought a chartered accountant from the UK named Carl Hill. Uh, other people on the audit project were... Um, Peter Gillum and Wendell Reynolds and Ellen Reynolds and uh, Ted Street. Uh, and that might be all. There might have been one or two. And others. what was the purpose of this project? Well, um, so the IRS uh, had had, you know, said that we weren't a legitimate church, that uh, funds were inuring to L. Ron Hubbard. So and no audits in not not you know not Scientology audits, but financial audits had ever been done on any of the records of the Sea Org. Oh. So it was our job to gather up all those records and um, audit them. And uh, Marty Greenberg was um, in charge of that project. He reported directly to Mary Sue every day. He wrote our daily report and let her know what was going on. And, um, you know, Marty was uh, such a dear, sweet man. Um, and, you know, I knew nothing about finance or audits or anything. And so um, he, <laughs> you know, we, we were using Olivetti hand crank adding machines. We had big ledger sheets that, you know, were all handwritten. Um, and he, he started me out because I had neat handwriting, I put all the titles on all of these spreadsheets, including the column headings. And, you know, each one said OTC, you know, 1967 bank reconciliations or whatever it was. And, um, and from there, after I had done all that and other people were actually cranking the numbers, he taught me how to do um, transfers and exchanges. And exchanges were um, from one currency to another because we visited so many countries. And originally in the Sea Org, they even were using pound sterling. 
Oh. So, um, so he taught me how to do all the exchange worksheets. Then he taught me how to do transfers, which were transfers between bank accounts. Um, and you know, that records had been kept of everything. Um, there was a, a staff banking officer on the ship uh, from 1967. The records that we were looking at were done by uh, Reva Biddleman, who was later Reva Spence. Um, and uh, she kept beautiful books. Um, it wasn't always neat, and, but you know, the early records were all really good. Uh, then I was taught how to do bank reconciliations. And so then when we, you know, that went on for a long time, obviously that project, when we s left the ship and went to Clearwater, um, uh, several of us who had been on the audit project were posted in Clearwater in the flag guardian office in, and Wendell Reynolds was the assistant guardian for finance and his uh, wife Ellen was the audit branch director and I was posted as the audit enforcement and handling officer which meant that um, I was directing and supervising the people in the department records assets and material on how to continue doing the bookkeeping that had we had been doing before only now it was under um, Church of Scientology of California. And all of the OTC records were kept in a big vault in the Clearwater building, which was where we worked. Mm. Uh, later, uh, I was interviewed by a, an attorney who was working on the IRS case, uh, a Scientology attorney. And he was they wanted me to testify in the courtroom because all these spreadsheets had my handwriting on them and they could say, you know, Mrs. Barnes, I was at the time, were these your spreadsheets? Oh yes, they were my spreadsheets. I wrote all those, you know, and, and they were going to, and he was questioning me as though he was questioning me on the witness stand. And then he, they finally came up with a bump in the road, which was um, that I knew where the OTC records were kept. And he looked at me and he said, um, you wouldn't be willing to commit perjury about that, would you? And I said, no, sir, I wouldn't. And so oh. I never got to testify. That's amazing. A Scientology attorney outright asking you if you could lie under oath. Well, but he said it in such a way that covered his butt, you know, you wouldn't be willing to do that, would you? you right. Know? And I said, no, I wouldn't. So, um, yeah, yeah, amazing, I yeah, because, um, the, I believe, uh, the government, uh, in 1967 is when the courts found that, uh, money was inuring to Hubbard and so they canceled the tax exempt status. And so, this sounds like an early project, uh, in the 70s to try to reverse that that wasn't successful until 1993. I know. Yeah, the um, audit project started, I'm pretty sure, in April of 1973. Um, and it was Marty's job to figure out how to, you know, he explained to me that the purpose of, or, or the, the job of a certified public accountant was not the bookkeeping part, but to, um, what's the terminology, to assign significance to the transactions. Mm. So it was his job to come up with significances that were acceptable, but you know, with what Hubbard was getting, it was pretty hard to do. So I guess that's why they had a little trouble <laughs> getting the tax exempt status. I don't know whatever happened with the court case because by that time um, I had moved on to um, Scientology Missions International. SMI. Mm -hmm. Well, before we move on to that, let me ask you about a couple of things on the ship just to see if you have a memory of them, because it sounds like you were there, except for the wedding, it sounds like you were there pretty continuously from 71 to 75 when everybody moved on shore in Florida. Correct. I was in the crew, you know, that, that was divided up into three 
three groups, the group that went to Daytona, continuing to deliver services, the group that went to New York, who were continuing the international management of Scientology, where my husband went, because he was in management, and the group that stayed behind to clean and mothball the ship, Mm. and then got flown into Florida to clean the Fort Harrison and the Clearwater building to prepare for the rest of the crew to come and join. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was under Fred Hare, that operation. So um, again, you first saw Hubbard with your own eyes in February 71, I think is what you said. Got got, Got to know him pretty well. I mean, you were on the ship with him every day for years. You know, Yes, I I saw him. I can't say I got to know him. My husband did. My husband did because he was in management and he was briefed a lot by LRH. I got to know Mary Sue because um, of working under her on the audit project. And you saw him before his seven or eight months in Queens and you saw him after his seven or eight months in Queens. Uh, two things. Uh, the 1974 motorcycle accident. Do you right. do you remember about anything about that? Very vague. I remember um, that Jim Dinkowski was called upon to take care of him. I remember that he had had a motorcycle accident, but it was very much downplayed. Not a big deal. Um, I remember... Uh, going to a see a movie in i think the dominican republic and mary sue and ron went were there and she was trying to distract him from his pain no doubt um interesting yeah that's really all i remember because again we you know we weren't really told what was going on right how about the rock concert in madeira Unfortunately, I missed that. Oh, really? I, yeah. I um, Although what I was doing was pretty cool. I was on the only combined Sea Org Guardian Office mission. Um, it was a mission that was run by the Guardian Office, but staffed by Sea Org personnel. Um, we were run by Herbie Parkhouse, uh, who was the Uh, deputy guardian for finance um he well so the story was that um (laughs) there had been a a lot of financial irregularities on in the european continent and um (laughs) what they were doing was they would uh reg a person for money for services at any given org and then that person had, you know, a bundle of money because they get all the rich people a bundle of money on account. And then they would bring in somebody else who didn't have any money. And they'd say, oh, um, Mr. Hammerberg, can we borrow some of your money for this new person who needs services? And she'll pay you back. Sure, no problem. So then it was counted again as gross income when it went from one account to the other. So the statistics were going up and up and up. And, 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 and then something hit the roof and they figured out what was going on. And they sent in this finance mission to figure it out. And there were four of us on the mission. Uh, Wally Burgess was headed, headed up the mission. Um, Peter Gillum and I were doing the financial audit of all the books and we would go into an org and we'd figure out, I mean, it was, it was a mess because the money was going everywhere, all over the place. And we'd have to trace it. It was like this tree. We'd have to trace it back. Where did this money first come from? And who, and then where, where did it go? And then from there, where did it go? And from there. And so we had all these spreadsheets where we were doing all this and then Ron Loving was the um, ethics officer on the mission, and he was um, in charge of putting people on the cans and doing sec checks. Uh, it it was actually a really fun mission because it was long. We spent um, six weeks in Copenhagen, uh, during part of which time we were in Malmo in Sweden. 
because we were working for the guardian office, we got a day off every week instead of every other week. We ate like kings. We stayed in a nice hotel. Um, and uh, it was heaven. <laughs> we then ended up uh, spending quite a bit of time at the end of the mission in um, St. Hill. And I got to stay in the manor. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I had my own room because I was the only girl on the mission. The other, the three guys had to share a room, but I got my own room. All right. Well, let me ask you a nutty question because there are a number of independent Scientologists, none of whom were ever on the ship. Uh, that's the important thing. Who believe that sometime in 72 or 73, the CIA kidnapped L. Ron Hubbard and replaced him with a double. <laughs> and, <laughs> Serious? Yeah. And <laughs> and uh, they get real angry with people like Janice, who saw Hubbard before then and after then and said, yeah, it was the same guy. Right. So you're you're one of the few other people that I've met who was around Hubbard before that date and after. Yeah. Did you notice that he had been replaced by a clone or a double after 1972? You're laughing. No, of course, it's silly. I mean, the briefing that he gave us when he came back was phenomenal. The entire ship's crew went down into the lower hold of the ship, and it was so Obviously, L. Ron Hubbard, I mean, he, no one else could talk like him, could make jokes like him, could capture an audience like him. He was really good at that. Right, which only proves you're part of the deep state and you've been controlled by the CIA and you're, <laughs> you're not going to tell us the actual truth. So I, I appreciate that, Sandy. Uh, another big question, and we've we've talked about this a little bit before, Um you were also around Hubbard and Mary Sue when Snow White was going. Uh, Hubbard wrote the Snow White directive when he was in Queens in April 73. He came back. He gave that to Mary Sue. It took a while for it to get going. But in 74, no question, under Mary Sue uh, and Jane Kember working out of London, that this group of Guardians office operatives began infiltrating and burglarizing government offices in the United States, Canada, England, a bunch of different countries, right. until they were caught in 1976, and that led to the FBI raid in 77. Right. And, you know, I've you've, you've sent me some really interesting thoughts about this. Tell me uh, your feeling about what Hubbard knew about her, what he should have known about it, how close he was working with Mary Sue, and, um, you know, how much of it was coming from Hubbard. Yeah, Tony, um, you know, I was a low man on the totem pole for that. Um, I do remember Fred Hare was running the program um, from the ship. I uh, and heard that he was running Snow White. I didn't really know what Snow White was. Um, uh, I observed with my own eyes, Hubbard and Mary Sue, every day she was briefing him. Um, they sat together in his research room, but they sat right by one of the windows. You could walk by and see them. Um, at the time, I had no idea what, you know, they were talking about. Um, but I know they were together every day and that she was briefing him. And no doubt he was giving her orders. Right, right. Well, I mean, he wrote the directive. He's the one that came up with the whole program. Right, right. So, the, um, the, you know, I didn't know anything about any of it until the raid. And then uh, after the raid, every guardian office, is, uh, certainly at FLAG, we had to go through all of our files. I mean, filing cabinets and filing cabinets and filing cabinets worth of written handwritten orders and printed mimeo printed orders and we had it was called the vetting project we had to take a little exacto knife and cut out the signature and the distribution on every single piece of paper it took months and then all of that went into a shredder 
And then the shredder, well, probably other documents that I didn't know about, the whole thing went into the shredder. And then I went with uh, a couple of the people that would take the shredding to a giant incinerator in, I don't remember if it was in, in Clearwater or in Tampa, but this huge dump yard where they had this ginormous incinerator where you would dump your barrel of shredding into this thing, you know, and so, you know, that was my experience after the, the raid. Not only that, but there was a project at FLAG uh, to uh, solicit funds from the public, because the staff didn't have any money, uh, to pay for the legal fees, the legal defense fund. Uh, and I worked on that um, under a guy, I can see his face, but I can't remember his name. Um, and he was basically, you know, getting money out of the public to pay for the legal defense of Mary Sue and Henning Helt and all the people, Mary, uh, uh, Jane Kember, all the people who were indicted. And so that really was my only, you know, experience with that, my personal experience. Um, do you... Do you remember when Mary Sue went to prison? Did you have a thought that she was kind of falling on her sword for Ron to keep him? Oh, out of it? totally, totally. I mean, I I loved Mary Sue personally because she was good to us. She gave us time off because she always treated her people so much better than Ron treated his people, and she um, she gave us time off. She gave us consideration uh, later when we were in Clearwater for having children. Um, she was very family oriented. And, um, and so, you know, I really idolized her. And, uh, and that was why I wanted to be in the guardian office was so I could have some of the perks that the rest of the crew didn't get. Um, again, because I was in finance, I had no idea what was going on in B1, the information bureau. I, no clue. No clue. So you 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 didn't know about the spying and the uh, plots to ruin people and to... I heard little whispers now and again. I remember Milt Wolf, who was in PR talking about this great person that they had in Clearwater who was helping them, who was not on staff. It was Tori Bezazian. I told her about that, by the way. Wow. Yeah. And um you know, she, she said, Oh my God, you remember that? Yeah. She, anyway, um, great. Tori Christman, right. Right. Tori Christman, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I remember, uh, hearing something about a, um, fake hit and run on the mayor. Yep. Casares, I think right. his name was. Gabe Cazares, and, right. and I seem to recall that uh, Tom Ritchie was, uh, in, involved with that. Uh, he was in B1. Um, but you know, it was just a little flitted by, you know, they were kind of bragging, you know, in right. a staff, at a general staff meeting of, of the whole flag guardian office, which we would have in the, in the assistant guardian offices, assistant guardian officer office <laughs> wow um and before we move on just you were at flag when you say when we were first talking about flag you meant the flagship that l ron hubbard was on now when you're talking about flag you're talking about clearwater the flag land base right what was the attitude at that time towards the city and the people that lived there before you came in um Okay, well, so we came in as um, United Churches of Florida, and this was our new shore story. First, we had been Operation Transport Corporation. Now we were the United Churches of Florida, and we we tried to get away with that as long as we could. At some point, they figured out who we really were. Uh, and then it was just, you know, really, we didn't have anything to do with them. There was a little store across the street from the Clearwater building. It was kind of like a Woolworths. And they had a little uh, counter with a fountain. And the woman who worked at that counter was so nice to all of us. And um, 
and and she just she was so sweet that when I finally did the Dianetics course, which is the first time I read DMSMH, <laughs> and this would be like probably 1976 or seven. Wow. I'm, yeah. Uh, I, you know, part of that course is you have to go find somebody on the street and bring them in and give them an auditing session. Oh, wow. And I asked her if she would come in because she had been so nice to me. And she was like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, you people, you know, you're very nice and I, I care for you very much, but no, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get involved, um, which was a big disappointment, but you know, really she was the only person in the whole city of Clearwater that I ever spoke with. Yeah. That I remember. Were, were there some other moments where you suddenly realized that uh, the outside world wasn't so thrilled with Scientology and you started to wonder about what were you doing in an organization that people had such negative thoughts about? How did your process of getting out go? Well, <laughs> um, you know, by that time, I was well and truly indoctrinated. And so any thought that uh, that somebody outside of Scientology was against Scientology just meant that they were uninformed, that they just didn't know any better. And eventually, you know, we'd get them. But uh, so what happened was um, Roger Barnes and I were married. We were, um, he was the first executive director of WISE. Oh, and from that, he became the first executive director of SMI. So he was the first executive director of World Institute of Scientology Enterprises, yep. which is a kind of business consulting front group that Scientology operates to get Scientology in through business consulting. And he went from that to Scientology Mission International, which runs the Mission Network. That's right. Wow. And we were fired. Uh, I I became his, uh, you know, I really can't remember the title of the position, but I was like the chief financial officer. Okay. So it was my job to collect the tithes from all the missions and to do the budget for SMI and um, to, uh, I was responsible for the investment of our reserves, which was a million dollars. Um, these are things that I could not take with me out when I left. I was never going to get any reference that I had been able to do this kind of stuff. Right. So, um, yeah, that's a whole other story. But um, I was a chief financial officer and uh, I was doing all of those duties. And um, <clears throat> when... Uh, Miscavige came in and decided he was going to take over. He had to get rid of various opinion leaders within the church who could legitimately question his authority. Right. And, and that included um, David Mayo and Kerry Gleason. And I think Bill Franks was on that committee of evidence um, and Roger Barnes uh, who had a huge following because of all the world tours that he'd done and all the people that he'd, you know, plus all the mission holders in the world adored him. And, um, and our statistics were in power and in SMI. Well, Miscavige couldn't have that. Uh, so he demolished the mission network. Basically he, he had the famous mission holder meeting where he declared, uh, the, the top mission holders as suppressive persons. Uh, I didn't attend that meeting, but from there, the fallout happened and, um, and, and Roger, what, well, I was taken, uh, to flag. I was, we were in LA at the time we had been in England where we were we we were basically taking over the tithes from mission office worldwide which was under the guardian office there was a whole written pages and pages from L Ron Hubbard of the purpose of SMI and how it was unbeknownst to me at the time it was the beginning of the end of the guardian office and um he, the, it started with taking their money away which is which was the purpose of SMI. So um so 
Uh, and, and and let's put it in context. He kind of had to do that because it was the Guardian's office that was running the Snow White program. They got caught. Yeah. 11 top executives went to prison, including Mary Sue. She fell on her sword for Ron. Yeah. And so now the church was under a lot of pressure. And so they had to get rid of the Guardian's office, but they didn't, they couldn't get rid of any of the operations. Sure, so it yeah. had to be switched to other organizations, right? Sure. Yep. Yep. When I left, by the way, I took a photocopy of the those pages of handwritten instructions about the setup of SMI, all in in Hubbard's handwriting, um, and my husband gave it back to the church. Oh. It killed him. I took it as insurance. You know, right, I mean, right. I I wasn't stupid. You know, I was naive, but I wasn't stupid. So uh, anyway, so so this big committee of evidence happened. I went to flag for some training and then they took Roger to uh, Hemet, which I didn't know where it was. You know, everyone in Hemet knew what was there. I mean, all the people who lived in Hemet, the city of Hemet, knew this was a Scientology organization, right. but everyone in Scientology knew it as over the rainbow. Right. So um, all I knew was he was over the rainbow. I had no idea what the location was. Wow. And um, I was hauled in by the finance police at 1030 at night in Clearwater. And um, I was shown my um, committee of evidence written up um, and I was being uh, commented for um, embezzlement because I had bought a hair dryer for when I went to, so I could fix my hair when I went to see the mission holders. Um, yeah, I use, you know, I bought a $10 hair dryer and that's embezzlement, don't you know? Um, and I don't remember the other, but it, it, basically they hauled me in and they said, your husband is going to be declared and um, kicked out. And we want to know if you're going to go with him or if you're going to stay. And I said, I need to think about that because, you know, we'd been married for nine years. We had a three-year-old son, but our marriage was kind of on the rocks. And um, so I said that, I said, I need to think about that. And they immediately said, wrong answer, you're out. Wow. Because I wasn't dedicated enough to right. just immediately say I wanted to stay. Yeah. So um, I said, well, where will I go? It's 1030 at night. I have a baby in the nursery, a three-year-old child. They said, the guy says to me, not my problem. I said, well, where am I going to sleep tonight? He says, get a motel. I said, how am I going to pay for a motel? At this time, we were making $25 a week. Right. And he said, use a credit card. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> You must, I said to him, I virtually, I, I literally said to him, you must be new. Uh, you know, I said, I don't even have a bank account, let alone a credit card. And um, he said, well, it's not my problem. You know, you're out of here. And I walked out of the Clearwater building and I stood out there and I thought to myself, this is not right. I had seen crazy things happen, you know, phases of craziness before. And I thought, you know. I'll go in and ask for a comev. And then I thought, no, because then I'll go to the RPF. And so then I thought, well. And I'll just translate that. You're saying you were going to ask for a court martial, but you'd get sent to prison. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I thought, well, I'll leave and um, I'll come back when things get sorted out and it gets back to sanity again. Had no idea Miss Cabbage was pulling all the strings at that point. So, um, so I, uh, hopped on the, uh, family bus that went out to the quality Inn where the nursery was, my brother had a room out there with his wife at the quality Inn, And I slept with my baby on the floor of their motel room that night. And my brother and I stayed up late and we brainstormed, you know, who did we know who had money that could fly my me and my baby back to California, which is where my family was. And, you know, as it turns out where Roger was. So we didn't want to call my dad because it would be bad PR for Scientology. Uh. 
And um, so we finally came up with a person who um, had left the Sea Org a few years earlier. And against the rules, I had stayed in touch with her. I knew she had family money. So we called, I called her that night at about midnight, but it was only nine o'clock in California. And I told her that Roger and I were being declared and she totally laughed her ass off. She thought that was the funniest thing because she knew us both. And it was like, well, oh yeah, you're really suppressive. Right. <laughs> she thought, and anyways, the next day she went to the airport and paid for my ticket to go to California. She, on her way home from work, she picked up me and my son. She brought us to her house. She put us up for a month. Wow. We, yeah. Yeah. She was amazing. She's now married to Roger Barnes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I set them up after Roger and I split up. Anyway. Um, yeah. So I lost our thread. Well, no, I just wanted to know about you getting out and uh, that's yeah, how, how I got so, out. So, so you're out of Scientology. You're still young. You have no bank account. You have no credit cards. How did you get we your had, life together? We had, we had $250 two suitcases and a baby and that's it. And we stayed with my dad for three months. He, we couldn't tell him what had happened because yeah. again, bad PR for Scientology. Right. He had no clue. He just said, you got to get a job and get out of here, you know? So uh, Roger was like spinning, you know, I don't know what to do if I can't clear the planet, you know? And uh, I went out and found a job in a title company um in the finance office doing really i mean because i you know i knew how to be a chief financial officer i knew how to do internal audits i knew all this stuff but i didn't know any of the terminology that's used outside of scientology because they use different you know income disbursements uh records assets and material you know mm -hmm. we're you know, a, when I looked at the newspaper and saw Juan ads, it said A-R-A-P-G-L. I was like, what's that? You know, I knew what it all was, but I didn't know what the words were. So I started at the bottom, $850 a month. I went in, uh, actually the woman who hired me had been in a, um, in a kibbutz in Israel. So I told her who I, where I was coming from and she took pity on me wow. and she, and she hired me. And um, she had to explain to me, you know, she says, well, you're going to get medical insurance. It's the standard 80-20 plan. I said, what's that mean? <laughs> you know, I was so, but she was very uh, patient with me. I quickly figured out, uh, so we had no car. We, um, my father loaned us the money to get a cheap apartment in San Jose, Um $400 a month. We later discovered that there was prostitution and drug dealing going on in the neighborhood. And that twice in the year we lived there, a body was found in the dumpster behind our apartment. But, you know, we didn't know. And we would, we were close enough to a grocery store. We could go to the store, buy our groceries, roll the cart home, then roll the cart back after we emptied the, we took the bus to work. We took the bus to the beach in Santa Cruz. We, you know, we didn't, we had nothing. Our first, my first credit card was lovely Macy's. Right? I mean, no one would grant us credit because we had, right. where have you been for the last 20 years? You know, right. where have right. you been? And we, you know, we had no history, no bank accounts, you know, anyway, uh, it was a slow process. Um, it was grueling and um, the, you know, I had to deprogram myself slowly 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 uh it took years and um you know after three years um roger kept wanting to go back mm. and um <clears throat> finally uh dd Dee Dee reesdorf called me up from santa barbara and said uh, i'm working at the advanced ability center Ooh. under david mayo and um, I'm done and I need to recruit you as my replacement. I've been doing the books. So this was a compromise uh, with Roger because he wanted to work in Scientology. I was done at this point. I was like, <laughs> but we could work 
five days a week, eight hours a day, have a normal life and make decent money. We were each going to make $500 a week, which was pretty good money for us back then. Um, this would have been 1985. And um, so we moved to Santa Barbara and worked at the Advanced Ability Center. It took me about three months to figure out that they were going under mm. um, because they were being sued by the church and they were paying enormous attorney fees and they were running out of public because the mass exodus that had occurred at the end of 1982 and early 83 you know all those people had come to the advanced ability center gotten their services and now they were done and we didn't have any new public uh so um yeah anyway it closed when it closed its doors roger and i separated because you know the funny thing at the advanced ability center they said, well, we're going to get you into session. And I was like, nah, uh, I'm not really interested in that. Well, because of that, they thought I might be a plant. Because uh, they, they didn't, didn't have plants. Oh, yeah, did. I know. I got conned by those plants. Mm. Um, but uh, at the time, you know, I just didn't want any auditing. They did manage to get me into session. But I had this constant withhold, which was, I don't believe in this shit anymore. And I don't want to be here. I just want to do your bookkeeping and go home and take care of my son. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, I want to ask you about one more thing before we're done. And that is, you mentioned San Jose. You were at the premiere uh, for Brothers Broken. Tell me about it. Yeah, it was fantastic. It really was. Um, Jeff and Robbie Levin, I believe that's how they pronounce their last yeah. name, yeah. Um, went to the same high school that I did, although before me, um, they were a big band in San Jose back in 67, 68. Um, and of course, I knew about them. And I knew that they'd gotten into Scientology. In fact, one of the reasons my brother got into Scientology was because people had gotten into Scientology and he thought, well, that's a good reference. Wow. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I, you know, and, and Janice, uh, Grady wanted to, uh, she called me up and said, I want to come and see the premiere. And I said, why don't you come and stay with us? I've stayed at her house before. So she came and stayed, uh, at our house in Oakland. Um, Hannah, uh, Whit Whitfield. Thank you, Whitfield. I always knew her as Hannah Eltringham. Eltringham, yeah. yeah. Um, she was actually my boss for a while when I was the Sea Org Personnel Control Officer, and she was CS1. Um, was flying in from Florida and going to Spanky Taylor's house, and Spanky was going to drive herself and Hannah up to see this premiere. So um, we all met up in San Jose. We went to the premiere um, it was the movie's really good, really good. And um, it was after that that I sent you an email to thank you. Um, I had no idea that you were responsible, largely responsible for getting Bob <laughs> for opening his eyes after 46 years in Scientology. Jeff Levin finally saw the light. Uh, and he, at the time, he was in the midst of a huge depression. Um, I think that if he had not uh, looked at your blog and uh, started asking questions as a result, I, I, I don't think he'd be with us anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, Robbie had gotten out years earlier, and of course, they were disconnected all those years, which is a large part of what the movie's about. But I loved the movie. Um, after the movie, uh, the uh, c cinematographer who had filmed the parts of the film that were um, taking place in current time as opposed to history right. um, came up and said, um, Jeff would like to interview you on film about the movie that we and we might be able to use that as promotion for the film. I said, sure, no problem. So. Um, I got interviewed on film Great. about my impressions of the movie. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it, you know, one, the only question I really remember Jeff asking me was he said, um, cause I was kind of, you know, 
on camera, nervous. Um, he said, uh, how would you compare this to other movies you've seen about Scientology? <laughs> and I said, well, it was, it was so much more personal. Mm -hmm. It was personal about the two of you. And, you know, I mean, in the movie at various times, e each of them cries, yeah, you yeah. know, because of the trauma that they went through. Right. And um, it was so moving. People yeah. in the audience were crying. Uh, and so I, I said, you know, it, it was so much more personal than other films I've seen about Scientology. It was really, really and, uh, let me tell you, they, those two, they have been through so much getting this to the screen. They had to work so hard and they went, that film went through many different versions as they thought about ways to tell the story and everything. So yeah. I'm really glad you were there. I wish I could have been there myself. Yeah. 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 It was great to see you in the film. I didn't know you were going to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did bring my, yearbook from high school that had a photo of the band people in wow. it playing at one of our dances wow. and um i got them both to sign it and um it, you know um let's see jeff just signed his name and wrote to sandy and robbie right wrote this is too cool he's looking at the photo I'm going to have to have you take a picture of that and send it to me and I'll put it on sure. the post. Sure. This was right. in 1967, Willow Glen High School. Wow. Well, listen, Sandy, this has been too long. I, I, uh, we've been talking a long time and I wanted to write about you a long time ago. I'm glad we finally got to catch up together yeah. and get your story. This is wonderful. You saw some amazing Scientology history and you got out. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and truly out. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being on the Underground Bunker podcast. My pleasure. <laughs>